Chapter 1 One Good Case In a real backwater 65 miles from the big cities of Phoenix to the north and Tucson to the south, tiny Florence in Pinal County has floundered since territorial days as the armpit of Arizona because its raison d'etre has been Arizona's state prison. A steady stream of shocking news stories about Florence's prison began in 1976. Front page articles about grisly murders, stabbings, gang warfare, regular escapes, corrupt prison wardens, and the way land fraud godfather Ned Warren orchestrated the murder of an inmate, Terry Sarah, the snitch of former associate threatening to unravel his kingdom. The violence extended outside the prison walls with the car bomb assassination of the Arizona Republic's investigative reporter, Don Bowles, when he got too hot on Warren's trail. This cacophony drew me in, fresh out of law school into its vortex, just as aspiring gunslingers in the last century were naturally drawn to the western frontier. For nine lonely months, I lived in the flop house of a trailer while working as a deputy Pinal County attorney, prosecuting every crime. Mostly drunk driving, bar fights and burglaries originating in the three precincts to which I was assigned. By that time, I knew my youthful illusion of reaching partner in a prestigious law firm was not in the cards. Any lucky break or one good case and I'd gladly leave the prosecutor's office and strike out on my own as a sole practitioner. This story is about that one good case, the murder of a prison snitch. I played a bit role as the defense attorney for the acting general of the Aryan Brotherhood who was accused of having ordered the snitch's murder inside Arizona State Prison. Why have I waited so long to tell this story? Time loosens tongues and unglues cold conspirator bonds. Time can soften stone cold killers into human beings who feel compassion and become eager for the truth to be known so that others may never go down their paths. Time brings maturity, a chance to reflect, to think, to learn. And I needed this much time before I was ready. I changed too, losing the pride I once felt for my part in earning my client's acquittal. I now realize that prejudice, manipulation, and ignorance, not lowerly skill, accounted for the series of acquittals handed down by the good jurors of Pinal County to the bewildered prosecutors who began the case thinking of themselves as latter-day Marshall Dillons, expecting to serve death warrants upon all the Florence 11 co-conspirators. I considered writing about this case after the fifth and final trial ended in 1981 and my client, Richard Compton was acquitted with my help. Eight years passed, still I'd done nothing. So I threw away all 40 volumes of trial transcripts and nearly all of my case files. Another decade passed, I married, raised a child and grew prosperous as a lawyer. Yet the story remained fresh in my mind. So in 1977, I began to write. I drove 500 miles to the Pinal County Courthouse in Florence where Sandra Rowe a helpful deputy clerk of court found and duplicated at minimal expense the 16,000 pages of microfilm court records from the state of California versus Terry Lee Farmer. From their prison cells, Terry Lee Crazy Farmer and William Stephen Red Dog Howard agreed to help me reveal the truth about their crime, the trials and prison life. And my old nemesis, John DeSanti and Bart Goodwin, Arizona Department of Public Safety investigators of the murder agreed to help as well. They told me how they had calculated to pit black witnesses against white killers until one black would break the prisoner's code of silence and provoke feuding within the Aryan Brotherhood. As a young lawyer, I aspired to a role akin to a hired gunslinger. I wanted a duel, leaving a clear winner and loser determined by the jury's verdict after a fair combat under the rules of the lawyer's game. As a middle-aged man bearing emotional scars from legal battles inflicted in both victory and defeat, however, I have learned that the courtroom's verdict and natural justice usually coincide. The Florence 11 eventually got justice and punishment, just not in the way the system intended. Arizona's taxpayers got something out of this era in the history of its penal system. The crescendo of prison crimes and violence between 1975 and 1978 created the political consensus of Arizona's massive investment in new prisons. After Wayman Small's murder, Arizona built a prison system that would never again be controlled by gang violence. 
At an incredible price, Arizona largely succeeded. To give credit where it is due, the next unit in Arizona's penal archipelago should be named after Wayman Small, the obscure inmate whose death galvanized public opinion and made its construction a top priority.